The game-winning shot got stopped, so how was Louisville able to complete the Marquette comeback? And an SEC coach is warning Kentucky fans, don't believe everything John Cal's trying to sell you. That's coming up right now on the Red and Blue Review, presented by the Winton Law Group and the Kia Store. The Red and Blue Review is presented by the Winton Law Group and by the Kia Store, the Floor Store, the Bachman Auto Group, Home Run Burgers and Fries, and Sam Swope. Well, probably most of the people turned off the TV. <laughs> and they're all going to say they watched it. Uh, but, you know. Surely he's not talking about the red and blue review, is he? Say hello to Howie Lindsay. That's not what Coach P's talking about, was he, Howie? Everybody watches this show. And, and he's right. Everyone will claim, oh, I was there at that Marquette game, just like everybody said that they were there at the Syracuse game. If the number of people who said they were at Syracuse were there, it would have been a 60,000-seat stadium. And this is Daryl Burr of the Cats Paws. DB, what you got coming up in today's show? Actually, we're going to be looking ahead as fast as we can after a loss like there was to Alabama. Looking ahead to South Carolina, another tough road test. Howie, you and I were at the ball game. I had my story written, a blown opportunity for Louisville against Marquette. Explain to us, please, how Louisville overcame an 18-point deficit with six minutes to go. It, it was absolutely remarkable. It, 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 they came from not just 18 points down, you know, not just that huge second half uh, deficit, but they looked dead. I mean, they looked like they were done. They were, they were absolutely done. You, you started to hit a couple threes with Preston Knowles. They got him open a couple times. A couple times he was not open. And then some big plays by other guys like Chris Smith you just saw there. Um, Stephen Van Treese had a couple big plays. The most remarkable thing to me, that, that's a ridiculous shot by, by Knowles there. most remarkable thing to me was that uh, Preston Knowles hit those shots, but also Terrence Jennings hit four for four free throws. If you would have seen this guy's free throws, uh, previously, no way you would have ever believed that. I mean, previously to this, uh, his awful looking shot, it kind of had this awkward spin on it. it, it he, I asked him as a freshman, what did your free throws look like? And he was like, oh, they're terrible. And for him to hit four for four, that was really remarkable. Well, Coach P told his kids, you may be a very old man before you really get to appreciate what you accomplished this past Saturday. I mean, honestly, I couldn't even breathe, so I couldn't really talk. Uh, I mean, I was just new, like, if, as long as we kept playing. I mean, it was just, I've never been a part of anything like this. Uh, I mean, I was just in the front of the press and just going crazy trying to get steals. And I mean, Chris Smith saw me, got some quick baskets, and Preston was knocking down the three. It's probably by far the best comeback I've been a part of. Um, it's a great feeling right now. It still hasn't all the way sunk in right now, but it's a, it's a great feeling right now. Coach Chris, how did you it really was a great feeling in that locker room to see all those guys so happy. And I think they needed a win like that. A couple of players said that this re-energized them for the rest of the season. He's absolutely right. And the fun thing is to be a part of these, to be courtside for this. Obviously, I wasn't there for that game, but I was there in 98 when UK was down to Duke and the NCAA Elite Eight had to come back and win that game. With, they were down 16 with seven minutes to go. And, of course, everybody remembers the big 31-point comeback that Patino led at Kentucky at LSU back in 94. Plan A was for Preston Knowles to make the game-winning shot. That was stopped, so they made up Plan B on the fly. What we're trying to do is, is get Kyle uh, to pop back because they were going to go after Preston, and Kyle had, had the intelligence when they both ran after him to go back to, to the basket. And um, the play was for Kyle to go back to Preston, and so Preston took, took the double team on and found him. I mean, I, I'm not taking credit for this at all. I mean, I was on the bench for most of the comeback. I just happened to be out there at the right time, but it was, it was the guys that were out there rebounding and the press and making big shots at the end. At what point did you... For being homecoming king, he's awfully modest. I mean, he, he made a perfect backdoor cut, and, and granted, he says he's going in for the offensive rebound. I think that that was part of the play. I mean, it, it looked extremely pretty and what great vision from Preston Knowles to realize he's got three guys on him somebody else may be open I don't think a year ago he makes that pass Terrence Jennings made four free throws in the game's final minutes and he said it all came down to his ability to play make-believe 
Throughout. Yeah, I notice like I see that uh, situation all the time, and I just notice some people they just they kind of lose focus. I just knew how to stay focused and pretend like you know it's not it's not that situation. It, pretend like it's the first quarter, you know, and we're up. You know, just going going there with the confidence, shoot it like that, and you'll be fine. TJ gave us a big lift coming down the stretch, making his free throws, rebounding, and that's a great spot for him to understand what rebounding can do. Um, really, really proud of the guy. And he, Louisville really needs him to rebound and be more effective. I mean, it, the best proof of that is, you know, Josh Harrelson going off for a double-double against Louisville. I, I think it, Terrence Jennings has all the ability in the world. Hopefully this is the type of game that can kind of jumpstart him for the rest of the season. If they could even get 10-5, and 10-8, and 12-8, and eight, something like that from him, I think Rick Pitino would be jumping up and down happy. Terrence Jennings came off the bench to help spark Louisville to that win. Terrence Jones has been coming off the bench, and Kentucky wins over Auburn and LSU. And TJ says he's fine riding the pine at tip-off time. Yeah, you don't? Yeah, um, it's only the first five minutes, and I was always tough. The last five minutes, it's just, it matters. So more about the total number of minutes? Mm -hmm. Nah, just the minutes that matter the most. And who the coach trusts is, I feel, putting in with the last five minutes of the game on the yeah, Terrence has nailed it perfectly. It's who the coach trusts to have on the floor the last five minutes of the game. Starting is an ego thing that the kids come in with out of high school, and they quickly lose that under Calipari because if you're not playing, you won't be starting and you'll be coming off the bench. And Duran, Duran Lamb proved early on you don't have to be the starter to make a huge impact when he set the freshman record that Terrence Jones then in turn eliminated and erased himself coming off the bench. One SEC coach is encouraging fans of the Commonwealth to not believe everything you hear from Coach Cal. And Rick is telling Cardinal fans to lay off one of his kids. We'll have that when we come back. But first, Howie, tell us how to get a subscription to the Louisville Sports Report. 38 issues a year can come right to your doorstep. 502-636-4330. Be sure to call and order. It makes a great gift. We can send, even send out a gift card. Cats and the Cards both on the road this weekend. Louisville making the trip up to Providence. Kentucky going down to South Carolina where they have actually lost in Columbia back-to-back -back seasons. So let's get into some of the deeper issues of this game by jumping right into our game time storylines. Talking about your power play performance for the guys from Providence, you got to be impressed. They're 25th in the nation in scoring. That's 28, excuse me, 78 points a game. Even though Providence does not have a win in the Big East, that does not mean victory number one couldn't come against the Cards. Look, we had to have that game. We have to have this game. You know, you, you don't know where the wins are going to come from in this conference. You have no idea. If, you, if, if you're foolish enough to think it's going to come at Providence, then you get come away with a loss. If you're foolish enough to think it's going to come with St. John's, you come away with a loss. We're just going to stick with our game plan. That's what they have to do. I mean, essentially, if I were a coach in the Big East, I would put get 10 on every T-shirt. Every T-shirt, every motivational thing, get 10. You get 10 wins, you're in the NCAA tournament. Before you get 10 wins, you're assured of nothing in this conference. I mean, you got to get those 10 before you can do anything, anything else. So Louisville's got to get those 10. So they've got to get it at Providence. They've got to get it at Marquette. The power play number for South Carolina, the team against whom Kentucky will be playing this weekend, is 4.4, which is their very razor-thin margin of victory. But that may be a stat that Cal overlooks because assistant coach John Robick says his boss is a lot more focused on his team. Uh, he's more concerned about our team than the opponent, no matter who we're playing. Uh, that, that's a big thing. I mean, we still go through our thorough scouting reports and what not to prepare. But he's concerned about the adjustments that we need to make and working on our weaknesses and, and continuing to get better. There are a lot of coaches do that. I don't know what the percentage is. I've always been curious who will spend 99% of their practice worrying about what we do and what we can improve. And then they'll look at some film, some scouting report on who they're playing next, but spend really no time preparing on how to stop what the other team does, the attitude is more of being on the offensive. Let them worry about stopping us. We're going to fix what we do. 
Well, I got an A in History 101 at Western Kentucky. The issue this weekend in History 101 at the University of Louisville, how we have the years 1977 and 1987. Why are those numbers so big in the history between Louisville and Providence? According to the game notes, 1977 was the last Providence win. 87 was, of course, when Patino took Billy Donovan and crew uh, to the Final Four, a remarkable run that really launched uh, Rick Patino's career. Everybody knew that he was a talented young coach, but that uh, set the precedent for everything else that happened afterwards. The history lesson for the University of Kentucky, Darrell, we don't have to dig too far into the past. Last year, when the nation's number one basketball fan-in-chief called the Cats at Columbia. Now, first of all, you got an A in history at Western because all you had to remember was World War II and back, sir, <laughs> so it was a lot easier. They were undefeated, and they get a coach from, call from President Obama because of their Hoops for Haiti fundraiser. They took that call that morning in Columbia, and then went out and laid an egg that night and lost, and their win streak ended. They were 19-1, and one, came home limping, and they've got to be careful. They'll be right back in the same situation this time. The biggest loser for Providence. Howie, do I have this right? They got beat by LaSalle? LaSalle. How about that? RPI rank 177. That's, that's one spot lower than Alabama, and we all know how bad Alabama is. All right, I've got a trivia question here. Does anybody know who the Furman, what, what their nickname is, the Furman? Furminators. No, Furman Paladins, Howie. Paladins. Yeah, look at that. Furman beat South Carolina, their interstate rivals, separated by about an hour and a half. 91-75, Daryl? Yeah, I figured that one out. South Carolina's got a lot of good wins, and as we looked earlier, Vanderbilt and Florida, and yet you lose to Furman. I think that there's a lot of games. I think you go to almost every schedule and see weird games like that, and then all of these huge comebacks that we've seen so far early in the year tells you that there's not – any good teams out there are not very many at all that are dominating and everybody is still really struggling to find out who they are and what direction they're going and everybody's trying to get their act together hopefully by mid-February. Howie says the Bachman difference maker in Providence will be Peyton. Peyton Siva, the star guard of the cards. Earlier this season, Rick Bettino said that Peyton would be the key to Louisville's season and since then, the kid has drawn a lot of criticism from the fans for their play and Patino says the fans need to back off a little bit. I just think the fans have to let up a little bit too. You know, it's it's um, this young man. If any fan um, knew him like I know him, or for that matter, you guys know him, this is someone you root for whether he's having a great game or a bad night. He was the happiest after the game and didn't play well. Yeah, and um, he is a young man that's that's a work in progress. As I said, he he's really never been a true point. He's got his lofty ranking out of high school because he was a a tremendous athlete, and um, now he's becoming a point guard and has gotten significantly better from his freshman year. He'll have good nights and bad nights this year, and um, he'll be, I think, very good as a junior, and he'll be just like Preston Knowles. He'll have a great year as a senior. If he can be like Preston Knowles as a senior, I think Louisville is going to be in good shape. Um, but I think he'll be better before that. I think by the end of this season, he'll have figured out this whole point guard thing. He'll be much uh, much more effective for Louisville. And I think, you know, the Marquette game was probably his worst game of the season, but he was cheering on the sideline. That's what you want to see from a kid. You're going to hear a lot between now and the final moments of the South Carolina game how bad this Kentucky team is all of a sudden after they went down to Alabama and got beat. Made a comeback, but still got beat. The coach who got swamped by the Cats last weekend in Rupp by 38 points says, don't believe what Cal says. This team is not that good. The team John had last year was more physical, but to really punish you in the post, punish you in the perimeter. Uh, this team's skill level, they, they can play a multitude of ways. They can play fast, they can play slow, and, and obviously last year's team was a lot different. They're, they're, they're very skilled. Uh, obviously, John's got them right regards to what, you, what he tells you all. He's got this team right, and, uh, and they're, they're a handful, they're a handful. Coach Cal might agree, if not for the fact they're 0-2 in the SEC, agree privately. I don't think publicly he'd ever admit they're right where he wants. But team's progressing. They just got to figure out the toughness it takes to win on the road. And they're, it's go, the entire year it's going to be an absolute uh, tightrope walk in terms of avoiding foul trouble or you're going to lose a game you shouldn't. That's just the way it's going to be the rest of the year with this team. When we come back on the Red and Blue Review, we're going to tell you what's new, what's next, 
and Watts Nuts, which provides a really smooth transition to Daryl Bird <laughs> in telling us how you get a subscription to the Cat Spas. I'm assuming it's because I'm new. How about that? <laughs> yeah, no? go ahead and believe that. Yeah, okay, sure. I uh, appreciate the opportunity. 800-641-3302. Tiger Tamers. Auburn was one of those. We just heard from Trent Johnson and LSU as well. A lot of coverage of that. And Randall Cobb's unfortunate departure from the U.K. Welcome back to the Red and Blue Review. We're going to be talking about what's new, what's next, and what's nuts. And on the Kentucky side of it, what's new is we, we think is going to be some more aggressive play from Darius Miller. Coach John Robick says that Darius is no longer shooting that awful fadeaway jumper. He says the junior's finally playing with the kind of offensive aggression the Cats need from him. Um, he didn't fade on any shots. Uh, the last couple games prior to this, he was fading on shots in the lane. Uses athleticism. He did that. He rebounded the ball well. I just try to drive and create shots for myself and my teammates. You getting a feel of what you need to do on this team now, Darius? <laughs> um, yeah, I think so. And I think it's still a work in progress. Um, I still got to get going a little bit more. I can do some more things. but um... Let me stun you, Mr. Gupton. I know that's not hard to do, but the Auburn LSU games where Darius was playing so well, first time in his career, back-to-back -back double figure scoring games. That is remarkable when you sit down and think about it. And he was a huge part of the comeback at Alabama that fell just short. He was not only scoring baskets, driving hard and being aggressive, he was making a lot of the steals on the defensive end and really took charge of it. I was glad for him to see him do that on the road in a very tough environment to, to really step forward. It's three games in a row, he's had really strong performances. He just needs to, to keep building on that and keep going and not let that slip back. For the University of Kentucky's former coach, Rick Pitino, when he was there in Lexington, it was all about marketing and packaging. I mean, here's a guy who made money on spaghetti sauce, for goodness sake. So <laughs> he's even marketing and packaging the Big East basketball schedule. How he tells me what he's doing now is he's divided up the season into segments in which uh, he's trying to win two out of three games in each segment. Uh, we've had a very tough year from an adversity standpoint, and um, we've come through it positively every day in practice and we're going to stick with our game plan of segments of winning two out of three in each segment and see if we can master that it's going to be very difficult to do we know that we made the goals goals very lofty but so far so good so far so good they've got to win two out of every three i think there are some where they could win three out of every three but there are also some where you're playing uh three in a row rpi top 15 teams and you may lose zero you know lose all three so I, I really like the idea though of dividing the season up into segments not just because the attention span of, of kids nowadays are, are like 15 seconds including me i couldn't concentrate on an 18 game season divide it up into six little segments where i can kind of you know divide it up in my head and say okay we got to win this next one or we're going to get behind it, it makes a lot more sense and it makes the season uh, seem like uh, more contested it's not so long when you divide it up like that that's what's new. Let's talk about what's next at the University of Kentucky is perhaps the emergence of Brandon Knight as a star player. We really think he could be as the point guard of the Kentucky basketball team. John Robick says Knight is getting better every time he takes the court. Um, he's leading the team. He's making better decisions. He's being more vocal. Um, and I think that's true with any freshman point guard, especially the freshman point guards that we've had in the past. Um, but, you know, the thing that separates him is that, you know, he can knock down shots. And he set the tone for us tonight offensively. Yeah, he absolutely did. I want to get back to Louisville just a little bit. What Howie's talking about, Interesting, it's almost like a Major League Baseball team. They've broken it into we've got to win, got to win, win or sweep this three-game series in this town. It's an interesting way to do it. But back to Brandon Knight, he is coming along very well. And again, another one who played well at Alabama once they got in the middle of that comeback, hitting a lot of huge shots. And, and he's really learning. He's a little bit like Peyton Seaver, what Howie was talking about. He's learning how to play point guard, and he's never had to do that until he got to this level and where he came from in high school. It was score 30 and then score 30 more. That was his object, and that was his whole job description. Now he's got to learn how to, to pass the ball and to distribute. He's doing well. Now we've got some others on the team that haven't quite figured out how to pass the ball yet. What's next at the University of Louisville is perhaps Preston Knowles emerging as a leader beyond basketball. And according to Coach P, when this season began, Louisville didn't have a go-to guy, but it appears now that Preston Knowles has firmly established that role as his. 
He's a terrific leader. You know, Preston is on a fence, um, and and to the left is uh, is not success. To the right is being very successful. He could be, he. There's very few le leaders amongst young people today, and I don't mean just in sports. I mean leadership today is very lacking in a lot of different areas. Uh, you, you see it politically. You see it in in business. You see it in sports. Leadership is is not there, and. Um, he has the ability to lead because he does it by example. He does it verbally. He's a very smart young man in terms of scouting. He picks up things and then he leads it and talks and talks to the players. He's always talking on the court teaching. He is, and he's doing a good job of that. It, once they named Preston Knowles the captain, I got to admit, I was one of many people who were like, mm, what's going on here? Because that was right after the hairbrush incident. Uh, he'd had kind of a pouty junior season. I don't know if pouty is the best word for it, but that's the best thing I can think of. Uh, but he, he just, I, don't, I didn't see him as that leader. I've seen that this year. Uh, he's been remarkable in the, in, the, uh, in the locker room after the game, on the court. Um, and I've been extremely impressed with the way he's handled this, this season and, and with the way that Rick Pitino has challenged him all season long to lead properly. Daryl, I'm going to ask you this and then how I want you to answer it. If you look at these games in which Kentucky and Louisville both attempted come from behind wins, if you look at it, Preston Knowles had the game-winning shot and passed it. Terrence Jones had the game-winning shot. He should have passed it, yet he took it. Is there some type of similarity we've seen between, between Kentucky losing and Louisville winning based on decisions being made on the court by leaders? Yeah, possibly. I don't know if you could pin UK's loss on that one play because it was 2.5 seconds and you're three quarters of the court away. It, it's tough to pull off anything, but you got to believe that play was designed. Go to Terrence, he tosses it left or right, and someone makes a, a better shot, a decent shot at it. But yeah, T Terrence is the one who has, still hasn't figured out how to pass the ball every time. There comes a point where he, he I don't think he maliciously does it, but it becomes very clear, i got to get my points, and he's got to get out of that. I think the difference there is, is Preston does something after the game. I've seen this several times, and he immediately says, my bad, my bad. That was me. That was me. I should have led differently. I don't think you're going to see that from Terrence Jones. I, I think he said, what? You know, it wasn't my fault. They weren't on. I bet you anything he made an excuse right after that play. Well, what's nuts in college basketball immerse in that Kentucky-Alabama basketball game and it's ESPN in-game interviews. Now, Daryl, it's one thing to interview these football coaches and basketball coaches at halftime, but Alabama's game introduced interviewing the coaches during the game. What do you think about that? Absolutely disgusting. And, and how far will universities continue to prostitute themselves before they step up to ESPN and say, no, you are not talking to my coach in the middle of a basketball game. He's got to step away from a timeout in the middle of a game to answer stupid questions that mean nothing. And it, it bugs me enough they do it at halftime. But to go in game, they have crossed the line big time. I completely agree. I mean, you look at, you look at what ESPN's doing uh, to the game. Is I, I understand they're, they're trying to cover the game effectively. That's, that's stepping beyond coverage. I mean, that is interfering with the actual game. Now, there was a theory that it was actually John Calipari's idea that he'll take ESPN up on any offer, <clears throat> the Atlanta thing. Uh, but, you know, I think it, it's probably ESPN's idea, and they tried to press into it as much as possible. Eventually, somebody's going to have to say, no, we're not going to do it. We're not going to do this anymore. I understand you want more coverage. Our coach isn't going to do it. But I think it's coincidental that ESPN introduced this after Billy Gillespie left Kentucky. <laughs> I think that might have been a related deal. Well, coming up next week on the Red and Blue Review, we're going to have the opportunity to find out if Kentucky can finally get an SEC win on the road and can, can, and can Louisville start making some headway in the Big East. That when we see you next week on the Red and Blue Review. The Red and Blue Review is presented by the Winton Law Group. And by the Kia Store. The Floor Store. The Bachman Auto Group. Home Run Burgers and Fries. And Sam Swope.